Mike Bledsoe here, CEO of the Shrug Collective. Today, we bring to you a new show, Feed Me, Fuel Me, hosted by Jeff Thornton and Mike Landers. As we're expanding what we offer, traveling to great guests, and introducing you to the best content, we have partnered with amazing companies that we believe in. We talk and hang out with the founders and owners of these businesses. Not all products are created equal, even if it looks like it on the surface. We've done the research and have been in the industry long enough to see what really works and what will make the biggest difference for you long term. With that being said, one of my favorite companies, Thrive Market, has a special offer for you. You get 60 bucks of free organic groceries plus free shipping and a 30-day trial. Thrivemarket.com slash feedme. This is how it works. Users will get 20 bucks off their first three orders of $49 or more plus free shipping. No code is necessary because the discount will be applied at checkout. Many of you will be going to the store this week anyway, so hit up Thrive Market today. Go to thrivemarket.com slash feedme. Enjoy the show. This is episode number 84 of the Feed Me, Fuel Me podcast with our special guest, owner of Blower Tactical Systems, Tony Blower. Welcome to the Feed Me, Fuel Me podcast. My name is Jeff Thornton, alongside my co-host, Michael Anders. Each week, we bring you an inspiring person or message related to our three pillars of success, manifestation, business, fitness, and nutrition. Our intent is to enrich, educate, and empower our audience to take action, control, and accountability for their decisions. Thank you for allowing us to join you on your journey. Now let's get started. Hey, what's good, fam? Welcome to episode 84 of the Feed Me, Fuel Me podcast. There's and Jeff back on the mic, and we are honored to have Tony Blower, the founder of Blower Tactical Systems, on deck with us today from Encinitas, California. Really, really humbled to have you on the show today. Uh, and r- really looking forward to this interview for a lot of reasons. Um, in looking at your your bio online and the telling of your story, uh, and we'll, we'll let you get into that in a second. Um, the things that were super intriguing to us were uh, the the concept of of fear management. You kind of have a, a, a quote unquote tagline: "No fear," not N O, but K N O W, fear. And um, you know, in our short dialogue prior to getting on the show, we talked about how. Um, your your management of fear and your ability to do so is a huge dictator of uh, a predictor of whether or not you'll be successful in multiple elements of your life. Um, but for those people who don't know who you are as the uh, the coach of fear management, um, give us the cliff notes of you know your life and how you you know your your where your interest uh, in fear management originally came from. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. Kind of excited to be here. Um, Yeah, so if I did the Cliff Notes version of my life, I'm 57. So if I just spent like a minute talking about each year that I was afraid, (laughs) it'd be like a 50-minute show. (laughs) show, And and then we'd be like, okay, time's up. Um, So I'm going to have to even do a shorter version of the Cliff Notes. Uh, And and I want to kind of throw this out there right in the beginning is the thing about fear and managing fear is that you never get to a point where you have no fear. And that's what actually inspired this change of, uh, you guys remember the no fear t-shirt company, right? And, you know, Mm -hmm. and they're still around, right? Adrenaline sports and motocross and stuff like that. Uh, well, I grew up thinking, man, I've got way more fear than any other person in the world, but I grew up in the sixties and we still don't, talk to this day we don't know how to talk about fear uh a a lot of athletes you'll go up to like i'll work with like pro fighters or uh you know competitive crossfitters and and people still are very uncomfortable especially guys especially um uh the um you know that type a athlete Mm -hmm. is like how you feeling i'm good you know don't like you know you come in a room hey what's wrong nothing right uh if you peel the onion, and this is just my theory, if you peel the onion on every decision in life, the speed with which you make the decision has a relationship to how you manage fear. Because what your brain is always doing is wrestling like, should I do this? Should I not do this? And if we peel that onion and go, well, why would you even think about that? 
Like if I said to you, were you guys afraid to brush your teeth this morning? You'd go, no, of course not. But if you got into a fight last, you know, uh, tonight and got punched in the face and had some teeth knocked out and, and had some exposed, you know, nerves or whatever, uh, right. And now like, you know, your jaw was broken and you're getting some dental work, you'd be afraid to brush your teeth. Right. And so, I mean, that's a stupid, you know, graphic example just to show you that that what happens with a skill set is as we develop competency in a skill set, uh, our fear of doing that shifts from our, our holy shit zone. I'm afraid to do this to our discomfort zone to eventually our comfort zone. You know, I was just talking to Andy Stump the other day and I've been friends with Andy for years uh, for people who don't know him. Uh, you know, Andy as a, a former uh, a Navy SEAL, a retired SEAL, uh, he's uh, he's one of those crazy base jumping guys now. And and you know, when you watch him on his GoPro, like on this side of a you know thousand foot cliff, getting ready to dive off into this you know you know ravine, like he's going through like a, a like like a fear management ritual. And he's one of the few guys that if you say, oh, are you afraid there? He'd go, fuck yeah. I'm like, Shut up. I don't want to die. Like, right. Where other guys are like, no, man, I fucking love this. Right. Um, and, but these are just, I, I, I refer to these as, as, as really just semantics at that point mm -hmm. that, that, uh, you know, people don't realize like Mike Tyson used to throw up before he, before his fights. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But you didn't notice that when you'd like see him walking down shirtless, you know, from the changing room to the ring, you know, black shorts, no socks, black shoes. You, you weren't thinking this guy just threw up from fear. Sure. Right. You're like, holy shit, he's going to kill somebody. Um, and so I just wanted to preface before I get into like, like the evolution and what really, you know, uh, uh, created a, a laboratory, an environment to study this. It, it's this idea that whoever's listening to this, I want you to turn on or turn off and just be a sponge and realize that that this no fear to no fear transition, it's a 20 year old term, like, you know, 20 years ago teaching, we were talking about fear and no fear. And I said, there's no such thing as no fear because every arena stress produces a new problem. So like if you, you know, you guys in the CrossFit community, you know, everyone here, uh, theoretically can snatch beautifully with a PVC pipe. So mm -hmm. let's say you've got, you understand the technique and you understand the coordination and the timing of the pulls, uh, and you've got a PVC. Everyone looks amazing on PVC. And then we add an Olympic bar and everyone looked pretty good. And then we start adding weight and it's not a weight that is actually, uh, uh um, creating a problem with your range of motion. Let's say it's a lightweight, but as people, as we introduce this unsolicited fear, of what if this weight falls on my head? What if I, what if I don't, you know, do this? What if I hit my chin on the way up? What if I pitch? What if I, and that focus there, that's the way to fear. And that's what we talk about is uh, understanding that you don't get to a place of no fear. It's K and O W fear. How do I look at fear? How do I manage fear? How do I develop or cultivate a different relationship? Because the people that actually self actualize who like, you know, is, you know, what research now is like getting that, that zone, the state of flow and all of that. Um, they've developed a, a, a instinctive slash intuitive relationship with fear where they use it as a fuel, as a cathartic source of inspiration, where the rest of us are like, you know, we're hiding under our sheets with a thumb in our mouth, like, you know, you know, Jim Carrey and Dumb and Dumber in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I just looked at the wad today and it's right. You know, here's an interesting thing. And I know I haven't answered any of your questions, but too bad. <laughs> I've, I've clearly hijacked the show um, in you know, we, we created a program, a few programs for the CrossFit community because, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of, you know, I've been involved in the community since 2006. Mm -hmm. And in um, in uh, one of the courses I did over at uh, some little uh, equipment company called Rogue mm -hmm. uh, years ago. So I'm over I'm over there in Ohio and I've got in the class. Uh, you know, uh, Katie's there, Miko's there, Graham Holmberg, you know, and, and 25 other athletes. And we're doing a version of our CrossFit Defense, CrossFit Sphere, Be Your Own Bodyguard blend. And, and I'm watching everyone absorb the information and I'm watching, you know, these athletes uh, move. And, and uh, Jeremy Kinnick uh, was there who's been to the games five times. And I'm mentoring him to help me teach these these courses. And he comes to me and he says, hey, uh, can I 
can I talk to the group about something I did as an experiment the other week? I'm like, sure, what is it? He said, I, I did a surprise Fran in the morning, but what I did immediately is I, ta- I did your, your no fear talk and talked about fear, identifying it as opposed to just sweeping it under the, 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 the carpet. Or what other people do is they, they posture, right? Hey, you scared about this? No, let's go, man. Right. And, and you get, you get that sort of thing. So what's interesting is, uh, Jeremy gets up and this is what he explains. And this could be fascinating. Comes in the morning, 6 AM class. And if you know, Jeremy, call him and ask him about this. Cause it's, it's, it's better when he tells it, but, but I'm going to do the best job I can. Nothing on the whiteboard. So the class is like looking at the whiteboard going, what the fuck are we doing coach? He waits for everyone to come. He says, you guys ready? Yep. Okay, we're doing surprise Fran. And he describes how every person, you know how body language is 60% of communication, yep. right? Mm-hmm. So every person has a different physiological impulse shoot through their system. So one guy looks down and looks up, another guy like rolls his eyes and turn, picture this. One guy's leg starts pounding, you know, like, you know when your leg starts vibrating because you're nervous, <laughs> right? And, and everyone, and, you know, someone goes, no, friend, like, 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 and he looks at each one and this, so this is the message when people participate in our, there are a trainer development or a course. It's if you look at fear as an onion and rather than just like cover it, no, I'm okay. Or put it somewhere else, like avoid it. I'll do this later. Or, you know, you just peel one cover off, like one layer off and you go, okay, let's go instead of unravel the whole thing. So the concept here is if you say to me you're afraid and I say it's okay to be afraid. Like Customato who trained Tyson, he had a great quote. He said the difference between the hero and the coward isn't fear, it's what they do with their fear. Mm-hmm. Right? And and so it's it's uh and that's deep, but guess what? That's one layer. Right. Because if I say to you guys, just go go lift, you know, afraid. Do the open afraid. Just do it. You'll adapt. That's true, right? Coach Glassman, greatest adaptation occurs between the years, right? <clears throat> but I'm going to write an article one day. I've been talking about this for years in the community. <laughs> cheering isn't quoting. Uh, uh, sorry, cheering isn't coaching. Cheering is not coaching. And so when someone goes, I'm afraid, and you go, it's okay, do it. I believe in you. Like, that's not really coaching. That's cheering. For me to understand and create an adaptation at a brain-based level where I'm actually educating the neurons and the myelin and the like, like at the research at the like the brain matter level. And so, what's the difference between you know uh, like a rich Froning and the rest of us? It, and it's it's really how they manage their fear and how they neuromuscular communicate. And so you don't ever see some of the anxiety or, 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 uh, stress in his body that you see in a lot of other athletes. And then you start to see that more and more at, you know, people that, you know, that level where, whether it's a Bridges or, or a Bailey or, or, you know, uh, you know, Matt or, you know, all those guys that are, they get up there and they're stress inoculated. Mm -hmm. And what's happening with the stress inoculation is they understand, you know, when I was working with Jeremy, the, the, I think the last year that he qualified at the games, he realized after failing in a snatch ladder that he, I said to him, hey, what happened there? Because he failed at a lift, at a weight that he could normally, you know, pull. And he went, he said, he looks at me, he goes, hey, coach, man, I just realized walking out there that I'm afraid of the tennis stadium. I had never... Right. And like, so that's something that you can, as a coach, you can talk about, right? Right. Because if you go out there and you go, I'm going to kill this and you look up and all of a sudden, like, you know, 10,000 people looking at you makes you go gulp, right? Right. That changes everything. So, um, so back to rogue, I'm going to tell 19 stories. You guys got it. There'll be a test at the end (laughs) (laughs) tracking all the tangents. But, um, so here's Jeremy at rogue. He's telling case surprise Fran, but he looked at, he looked at one guy and he said, you look afraid. And the guy goes, man, I hate Fran. I go every, he goes, everyone hates Fran. So, but what are you afraid of? He goes, the 15s, the 15s kill me. I can get the 21, but the 15s kill me. Right. And so, so Jeremy, so one of the things like we do when we talk about, like when we do like a course on dealing with multiple assailants, I'll say, Hey, uh, would you fight one guy to protect yourself or your family? And people are like, yeah. I go, what about two? 
It's like, well, and I go, what about three? Mm, right. And you can see like when we add numbers, motivation changes, but your motivation should never fucking change. Mm -hmm. Why would you protect yourself or your family against one, but not against two? It, what we've done is we've re redirected and diluted your confidence by giving you this false expectation of failure. Because if I said to you, you're going to fight three guys, but guess what? They're midgets from the Wizard of Oz. So they're 97 <laughs> and they walk with like canes. You're like, I'll, I'll, I'll fight 10 of those guys, right? In other words, if we think we're going to lose, that inspires fear. Mm -hmm. If we're sure we're going to win, it doesn't matter. So when I ask people, because what we're trying to do is create a more holistic relationship with fear and the decisions you make in your life. In other words, the decision to choose to protect yourself or your family should just be that decision. And then the, 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 the numbers you encounter just become the formula, like the math. Well, I got to figure out the algorithm to fight three. So we tell people like, uh, and, and Dan Millman has this amazing quote and he's, I don't know if you remember the, the name, Dan Millman was a gymnast, but, uh, he wrote the book, the way of the peaceful warrior. Right. And right. it's an amazing book, but he said this, he said, when you face just one opponent and you doubt yourself, you're outnumbered. And I was like, Whoa, that's so good. Right. Super and so is not that cool? Yeah, and cool. so, and so, uh, the concept here really simple is I tell people never let the math beat you. So I hate running a mile. So what I do is I run four, four hundreds in a row. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I play that game with myself. I'm like, I'm not going to run a mile. I'm going to run four, four hundreds. You know, uh, I hate thrusters. But what is a thruster? A thruster is a squat and a push press. I like squats and I like push press. If I do them together, that's a thruster. Right. So if I if I change my relationship to it, I change my physiology and my psychology in relationship to it as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. So what we tell people is don't let the math be you and you break down stuff. And so <laughs> what happened with Jeremy, he went through each person in the class and he gave them something to di different to think about. And this is the whole point. You have, is, are, is it mostly CrossFitters that listen to your show? Everybody listens to our Every show. Yeah. yeah. CrossFitters, CrossFitters are going to dig this. And but anybody who's got any type of stuff is like this is is don't let the math beat you is the message here yeah, and yeah. find a different way to, to look at this. Peel the onion and and get very specific about what your fear is, because then you can you can like meditate on that, introspect about that. And it, and it changes some of its its uh, uh, imagined hold on your performance or how you're thinking. So Jeremy looks at, I'll give you, just give you a couple examples. Hey, what do you, what's your, what, you know, why do you hate Fran? I hate the 15s. He says, don't do 15, do three sets of five. Yep, yep. And the guy's like, what? Now this is like, you gotta remember this is back like 2012. Like, like this is now, you, you know, if I ask you, if you get tired during box jumps, do you rest at the, on the box or on the ground? Everyone knows to rest on the box now, but because, Jumping down is freaking easier than jumping up in terms of <laughs> energy, right? in terms of output. Um, but there was a time there was a time when somebody actually posted that online and everyone went, duh, right? right? So 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 this is going back like this is uh, uh, 2012 2013. Uh, so several years ago, uh, this event with Jeremy and so 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 get this guys. He goes through each one. One guy goes, uh, you know, uh, I I can never you know finish 21. Like, I just always got to stop. So that was like, hey, do, you know, do three sets of seven, right? It was just like doing like these little mathematical configurations mm -hmm. because when you go into a wad or a business deal or a proposal or uh, whatever conversation and you've overwhelmed yourself with the, either the odds or what you've got to do, uh, it just, for some people that can't handle that other people, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter, but everyone's got their, their fear loop. And, um, so he did it through each one and the guy, like one guy who had like a nine minute friend went to a six minute friend just from a one minute conversation. Ooh. Everybody in the class PR'd, every single person PR'd. He was stunned by that. So at the, he was teaching the 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. He did the same thing again. They came in, whiteboard clean, surprise Fran, everyone like, oh shit. And he went through each person, like the guy, who, the guy who said, man, I just hate thrusters. And Jeremy said, okay, can you do a squat? Yeah. Can you do a push press? You're not going to do any thrusters this workout. You're just going to do squat and a push press. Just, just sync them up. Like just changing that, right? Like when you visualize that, if I say, I, don't, I, uh, I'm not going to run a mile, but can I do four, four hundreds? You're like, 
idiot, that's the same thing. Like, right, right, like, right. But if it makes it easier for me, then I'm going to run faster. Right. Right. And so the psychology behind it, so everyone focuses on the, on the uh, physical. My big focus has always been on the emotional, psychological relationship to how we move. Um, so there's, there's, when we talk about speed, as an athlete, we're talking about like our, 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 the GPP and the complex motor skill, you know, like if you don't know how to run properly, you're less efficient, you're not going to be as fast. So a lot of times we're focusing on technique and then the, the, then the, like, like a, an intense workout, we lose technique because we're sacrificing it for, you know, speed and power output, right? We're, we're, you know, but there's a, what's going on all the time in the back of our mind is if you're looking at the clock, if you're worried about the clock, if you're worried about losing, if you're worried about winning, all of that is, we might call this, we got a special lecture, uh, part of the lecture called what is the way to fear? And so uh, Kevin Ogar uh, brought me out to Denver to do a seminar a few years ago at his place. And after we did our 90 minute block, we have like this dedicated uh, 90 minute block on fear management in every one of our courses. The next day he PR'd his bench press by 20 pounds. Mm. Now Kevin's, now Kevin's best lift is, is you know post accident is is a bench press, mm. and at his level with he's such a, a positive mentally tough athlete that should have been like fractionals right it shouldn't have been twenty pounds, and um, you know we had a, 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 another guy Todd Thompson a, a masters competitor he's a firefighter from Georgia owns a box down there uh, several years ago. Uh, he injured both hands and wrists trying to save a, a clean, a, a, like a 295 pound clean, too far out in front of him. Mm. And he tries to save it and wrenches his hands back, he has an injury. And now it's 18 months later. He's at my course. I don't know him. I don't know his injury. He's at my course and he's never been able to hit 295 again. So what happens, guys, every time he tr loads 295 on the bar and tries to clean it? He talks himself, what do you think? He talks himself out of it. Yeah. Well, he's got PTSD, right, 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 from that event. Last time I lifted this, I wrecked my hands, almost ruined my career, uh, uh, you know, had to have rehab or, or, you know, whatever he had to do to get his, his arms back functioning. And it was painful and scary. So, you know, if if we go somewhere to eat, and you get food poisoning at that restaurant, it's going to be a long time before you go back there. Right. So you can believe in PTSD or not, but you can go, I'm not fucking eating there. I got food poisoning last time. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Let's, just, let's go tomorrow. Nope. Like, I'm like <laughs> <laughs> And so in his mind, consciously or unconsciously, he's going, this is the weight that almost ended my career. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the weight I got. So I don't know any of this. He's in my class. This is down in Atlanta. And uh, the, the the fear management block happens just before lunch, and then we break. You know, half the class goes and eats, and half the class goes and works out. Todd goes to work out. I don't know. We haven't talked yet. All of a sudden, I hear, you know, you know, when someone gets their first muscle up, right? You know, some fucking, you know, ah, woo, like some scream. I look over. He comes running over to me, and he says, "I just cleaned three oh five. Shit, my man. You're right. And I'm going, with, okay, good. And he tells me the story. 18 months ago, he had this injury, and he realized, listening to this block on fear, that he was lifting in the fear loop. Hmm. And so the fear loop, and the, the metaphor, guys, is this, is what do you think is faster, doing Murph with a weight vest or without a weight vest? Without. Uh, right, right, 22 pounds, right, or if you're using military weights. But 22 pounds, right, the the, the RX, and for uh, uh People who aren't in the CrossFit community, Murph is a classic, uh, very famous uh, 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 workout, and and it you to do it as as our ex, you're you're gonna wear a, a vest on it, and so I tell people, I ask them, uh, you know, is it same question? You know, it's easier to do your your you know uh, mile run and uh, what is it, 300, 200, 100. Uh, 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 squats, push-ups, uh, pull-ups. Correct. Yep. And then, and then another mile run with a weight vest on. So, and here's an interesting thing: is is in a class of twenty, depending on where you are, but for the most part, most people don't do it with a vest. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. It, you know, so you, we got our first, all our first responders will. And then of course, uh, you've got, you know, people who are hard chargers who do it, but there's, there's always some people in the class who've done it with both. And most of the people have done it without. And I tell them that fear is like a vest. And if you've never been in the military or law enforcement, you don't know how to put on your vest mm-hmm. and you put it on and you do your pre murph picture right? Where you, you, you put it on and you pose and you put your, you know, <laughs> sign up and yeah, we're going to do Murph. And then you do your post Murph. Well, here's what happens with somebody who doesn't know, uh, how to put on a vest the first time they put it on too fucking tight. Right. Mm-hmm. Because, like it's cool. You're doing like a picture, right? You put it on too tight. Now what starts to happen when you're, when you're, uh, early into your mile run with a vest that's too tight, you can't breathe. If you can't breathe, it impacts you at a physiological level. So you've got the competitiveness of winning. You're trying to go fast. You're trying to pace, but you're finding yourself restricted. Your breathing is labored. So what do you do in that moment is you rip open that Velcro and you put it back, but now you put it on too loose because the reaction and you're fucking laughing, right? It's like the audience can't see this because you've <laughs> seen this a hundred times with people, right? Oh, yeah. Now, so you went from being suffocated, like doing jujitsu with somebody who knows how to relax on top of you, and you're like, how much do you weigh, right? Like, <laughs> uh, right? And now you loosen it too far, so now what's happening is the vest is swinging up and fucking hitting you in your neck. So you're grabbing it by the collar, right, and pulling it down. You're still running inefficiently. People are getting further ahead of you, so you're in this win-lose panic of fuck, and now you eventually you stop and you figure out where it's got to be. The metaphor here is this, guys, is the vest represents fear in your life. That there are events, like if you're doing Murph to honor Michael Murphy, to, to, to if you're doing it properly, you're going to wear a vest. And there are things in life where you need the vest as a metaphor. There's going to be fear. But if you don't know how to look at fear, you may be holding on to it too tight and it suffocates you, or you're too cavalier about it and it ends up choking you, it's smacking you in the throat, it's still a distraction, mm-hmm. right? And so we're not being cavalier about it, but this is what we mean by K N or W fear, is I gotta look at something and go, okay, is this something that I should in- investigate? Is this an important like growth you know, for me, uh, experience for me? So anyways, that was, uh, yeah. that was a 42 minute answer to your, the, uh, what did you even ask me? The cliff notes. <laughs> <laughs> so That's you powerful. you said you said something in your bio that that is a, a great segue here. Um, in that people that experience a traumatic a potentially traumatic event <clears throat> and fight back in the aftermath have considerably less PTSD or symptoms of Correct. it than right. those who concede and cooperate with that traumatic event. Um, and I think the example you gave was, uh, just the, the simple example of getting in a fight, you know, somebody challenges you and you fight back, whether you win or lose, you walk out of it in a much better headspace than if you just put your hands down and allow them to kick your ass. Um, and I, I, th- I feel like that's a very profound discovery mm-hmm. for a lot of people, uh, especially in the context of, you know, whether you fight back or concede losing, uh, losing that fight and you know f- fighting back or protesting that contest versus you know just putting your guard down and and taking it mm-hmm. you know have you still lost but the the perception of that loss in the aftermath is considerably different um can, can you elaborate on that phenomena yeah and you know it, and there's a lot of research on that and they look at it you know uh uh, victims of uh, violence, uh, rape, like, you know, and, and, and I want to, I just want to qualify something. And I just started doing it about a year ago. And I realized the word fight can mean different things to different people. So I'm really big on, on, you know, words as icons. And I like to argue about semantics when it's appropriate, right? Meaning, meaning someone will sometimes say, well, that's just semantics. What they're really doing is just being lazy about discussing, uh, intelligently, scientifically, intellectually, a point because the the better the word, 
the more accurate the word, the more impact it's going to have on you as an athlete of life. Sure. Right? Like, not, not, it doesn't have to be CrossFit. You're, if we think of ourselves as athletes of life, how do we, you know, what are we eating? How are we sleeping? How are we moving? Whether it's to get to work or whatever. But getting back to what, what you're, um, what you're asking, there's a ton of research around that. And a lot of it is, has to do with self-esteem and dignity and, and just how you feel emotionally. Uh, nobody, you know, so the, the emotional word trigger out there is, is like, you know, helplessness, who wants to feel helpless, right? And that's the worst feeling. So when, when you're trying to solve the problem, you know, you're trying to be MacGyver in your life and you're trying to like, you know, cause you don't have any training. So you're going to improvise your way out. Um, even if the cavalry comes in and helps you, you are part of the solution. You aren't like hiding under a desk. You aren't, you know, with your thumb in, in you know, in your mouth like Jim Carrey in, in Dumb and Dumber, right? Going, waiting for somebody to save you. So there's a ton of research around that. And you just made me remember a, 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 a really fun conversation I had with uh, with Coach Greg Glassman, right? And and so. Greg is, is, you know, obviously his founder of CrossFit. The guy's like wicked smart. If you've ever heard him talk, he's one of the most eloquent and elegant speakers. He's captivating, mesmerizing. Uh, he's one of the few people I get nervous around when, when you know, I'm a public speaker. I've been talking for 30 years. We'll be in a conversation and, you know, he'll look at me and go, he'll go, hey, T, what do you think about this? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> because he's so fucking smart. I'm like, uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say. But, um, so we're at lunch uh, a while back, and he says to me, he goes, he goes, uh, he goes, hey, T, why do you think some people, there's probably some active shooter event or something happened. He goes, why do you think some people don't fight? And I went, you know, my, because I, I teach, like most of our courses are, to law enforcement and military. And these are like four and five day intensive, 40 hour intensive custom courses all. And we go through everything from start of flinch conversion to counter ambush shit, but it's all built around understanding brain-based training, understanding how your brain uh, uh, and your physiology, physics and psychology work together to become the human weapon system. And so they're pretty deep. And so because of the research I've done on this and talking, I'm used to talking for 40 hours, as you guys are discovering. <laughs> like, you can even breathe for 30 minutes, right? And just So what happens is when Greg asked me this, he like downloads, my brain starts to download this like 10 minute answer. Well, Greg, you know, there's so many influencing factors that, and he interrupts me and says, isn't it simply because they're afraid to lose? And I stopped in my track and I went, fuck me. And he smiles. I go, I go, you just did that again. He goes, did what? I go, you, like you take like this big idea and turn it into like one sentence that can't be improved on constantly varied functional, you know, movement, performance, high intensity. You like, you can't edit that. Right? <laughs> right? Like you can't like, right. So, you know, I went, it's just because they're afraid to lose. I was about to talk for five minutes. And it's because because if you weren't afraid to lose, why wouldn't you fight? Mm -hmm. Right. If you weren't afraid to invest, why wouldn't you invest? If you weren't afraid to ask this person to marry you, why wouldn't you? If you weren't afraid to quit your job and open up a CrossFit box or go back to school or why wouldn't you? If you knew it was going to succeed. So he looks at me and he goes, he goes, if the fight's going to happen anyhow, and you choose to fight, all you risk is losing the fight because you're all in. He pauses and says, and if the fight is gonna happen anyhow, you can't influence whether the fight is coming, it's happening anyhow, and you choose to do, to do nothing. What you risk losing is everything. And he's not just talking about your life there, he's talking about the most important thing is if you live through something, is your dignity, your pride, your self-confidence, your self-awareness, your, right? And so you see, and that's the biggest thing, my biggest focus, I, you know, I've been now uh, coaching and teaching self-defense for almost 40 years. But last year I started uh, uh, kind of a, a project slash movement all on just fear. And, and, and the title of it is, you know, no fear, K-N-O-W, fear. Because I realized that I grew up in the 60s afraid of everything. I was a competitive skier, I was in wrestling, I was this, uh, gymnastics, all this shit. 
Um, but I never, as good as I got, I was never able to excel in competition because I sabotaged my, my, my success worrying about, well, everyone says I'm really good. So why am I so scared? And that was my big takeaway is like, if I'm so good, why am I so fucking scared? Not realizing that nobody had ever explained that your body, your body, the physiological impact of excitement or adrenaline or, or, or fear, you know, that it creates these butterflies or changes your breathing pattern or makes you sweat. But if I had been taught that as a kid or as a teenager, my output and my engagement in, in the different sports I tried or different events that I tried would have been completely different. I believe that. And so I'm on kind of this mission now in this, this chapter of my life is like, like this idea that if we taught kids how to look at fear, how would that change what they end up doing? And you look at this generation of the, the snowflake generation and safe space, that's all fucking fear, mm. you know? You know, oh, Trump's going to get, you know, nobody's looking at how amazing things are, you know, in, in terms of like unemployment rates and violence down or the, you know, the stock market or whatever. It's like, it's all, it's all fear. And, you know, one of, one of our maxims from our, from our, 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 our the message in the course is that fear throttles everything we do. Mm -hmm. it from who we talk to, therefore who we marry from where we work to how much money we make to where we live. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, for our fitness buffs listening to this fear will influence how much weight you can lift. Mm -hmm. The weight of fear could be that 20 pound PR, right? It could be the difference between qualifying from the, in the open to the regionals, regionals to the games, right? Mm -hmm. It's how you manage your fear. Um, but fear also most importantly determines whether or not you protect yourself or your family mm -hmm. and how you manage that. And, and, uh, I like to tell people like, Hey, that the ability to protect yourself or your family is an arguably the single most important skill you could possess. It's the only thing about this, guys. It's the only event in your life where you need to handle things yourself. In the moment of a sudden ambush, you do not even have time to dial 91 on a 911 call. Mm -hmm. And and you know, calling a first responder is a and it's just a play on words is like, you know, while that's great and the cops want to get there, they are going to be minutes away. And this is happening in nanoseconds. And the reality is you're the first responder in your fight. And the cops are actually the second responder, maybe the third responder. Uh, and if you're talking about just the chrono uh, uh, chronology of like who shows up, right? You're, you're there. And so, you know, if you got a toothache, you can call a dentist, your roof's leaking, you call the roof guy, your car got a problem, you call the car mechanic. But if you got a problem with sudden violence, only you can take care of it. Only you can, you, you know, and so, you know, and this is, this is like, uh, again, don't get me started because we'll run out of hard, hard, this, uh, you know, hard drive space and talk about <laughs> do the whole course here. But, but it's an area where, uh, um, it, it frustrates me because I'm so passionate about it. And I, and I want people to understand that I'm not cavalier about violence. I abhor violence. I hate violence, which is why I've continued to research and develop the, you know, the, the program that I do. But no matter what I show somebody, whether it's, you know, this palm strike or a knee or an elbow or a finger in the eye or an improvised weapon or whatever. I mean, I can give you the most amazing arsenal, but if you're afraid to get in a gunfight, if you're afraid to take another life, if you're afraid about that scenario unfolding, it doesn't matter what equipment you had. Right. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to wield it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we come back to any, and I said, this is the beginning of the show that if you look at any, any question, right, that at some level, conscious, at a conscious level, and even at an unconscious level, uh, there's, there's a relationship between the reptilian brain and, and the cognitive brain between the limbic system and the amygdala and, and your, your cognitive thinking process of, is this dangerous to me? Is this something that I want to do? And a lot of that happens like, like, like way deep in your brain. So you don't even think about it, like brushing your teeth or yeah. going to work, you know, uh, I don't know if you remember Maurice Smith. Uh, he was a K one champ, Thai boxer, pro fighter, one, won the UFC heavyweight. So I like interviewing people who do crazy things like like fight, right? Right. I've interviewed you know warriors from every service. I've when interviewed rape, victim, and I'm looking for connections between victim and victor, mm. and mindset and how they think. And so, 
you know, I asked Maurice, I go, hey, you know, what's your pre-fight ritual? And he's like, he chills and he's like listening to headphones on, listening to, you know, uh, kind of like, you know, mellow R&B type things, you know. And you're, I've been in a lot of fight rooms before the fight. And like, this guy's got death metal on, right? This guy's punching himself in the face. Everyone's got their... This guy's like, you know, moving around, dancing like crazy, like every guy. So there's a bunch of fighters in the room. Everyone's got their pre-fight ritual. And so picture Maurice there lying on a massage table, hands behind his head, you know, headphones on, grooving. So I ask him like, hey, that's like kind of a counterintuitive pre-fight ritual. Mm hmm. Right? Like most people are like, let's go get like, get, get, you know, getting pumped up, smacking their face, punching lockers. Right. You know, I'm about to get in a fight. I got to get fucking fired up. So I ask him, uh, that's an interesting pre-fight ritual. Um, you don't, can we talk about fear, your relationship to fear? Like, are you afraid? And he said, he looks at me, he goes, let me ask you a question. He says, do you have a job? And I go, yeah, of course I do. He said, are you afraid to go to work? I said, no. He goes, me either. Right. Like his relationship was. Wow. Was, wow. Now, now how cool is that? Like that's, that's a fucking line in a movie. But if I said to a bunch of fighters who hadn't stressed <clears throat> to Maurice's level, right. And gotten up there. And I said, no more heavy metal, no more smack and no more bouncing around. I want you to lie down and listen to, you know, Sade and, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, classical music or whatever before the fight, like all of those people might lose. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause I've changed. And this is the thing that I tell people, cause everyone wants to know what, like, with like all the books on performance and, and peak performance and all that, they talk about the systems, you know, and emulating this. And I, I, I have a different opinion. I think you got to find your own way. I think you got to experiment. But you've got to go through the ritual serves you until it doesn't. Right. And and but and and so the key to that is self awareness, is going, man, I feel off balance or that didn't feel right. And my my performance indicated that. What do I need to think about? You know? So that's super interesting. <clears throat> like, yeah, that's super interesting. What I'm just trying to think, because as you're going through that story about the guy getting hype in the locker room, that's what I always had to do kick off on football when I played ball is because I had to have that first initial contact to sort of get that, that the butterflies out of the system. Right. But as I got older, it became like when I got to college, it was more of like you said, that smooth process of just like, okay, let's, let's sort of meditate through this process and, you know, think about what's going to happen. Not so much be so erratic about things. And it worked out in my favor in that respect. What are some triggers like that you think that people can sort of rely on if you do if they don't know that they're in a fear sequence or a fear loop or a fear sequence? Right. What are some triggers that you that you could sort of give somebody to say like okay, take a step back, breathe for a second, and recognize that this is what's happening. Now you can approach it in a systematic way, like breaking it down, you know, step by step. How you mentioned like mathematically or whatever. Yeah. And so, yeah, you just intuited what it, what it is. It's having that self-awareness to go, okay, I don't, I don't feel ready to go. Like a, like a baseball, uh, uh, batter stepping out of the, uh, out of the box, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, puts his hand up and stuff. that's self-awareness. I'm not ready for this pitch. I got to clear my head. You know, I was just thinking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, I got to pick up some eggs for breakfast, right? <laughs> and whatever he's like, yeah. he's Give you a stupid example he just steps out there because he's not in the zone right there right. fortunately you can do that you know when you're a batter and a pitcher but you can't do that in a self-defense situation and you may not be able to you can't do that like if you're you know if you're uh in a team wad you know you can't go hey guys let's stop a second i'm afraid for <laughs> uh, you know you, you know you, you can't do that in a car race you can't mm -hmm. do that there's a lot of you can't do that skydiving right yeah. you know so there's a there's a lot of so you almost need to have this understanding of fear and fear management before the event in an ideal world. And so we created something called the cycle of behavior. Uh, it's a neural circuitry of fear. It's a, it's a flow chart that starts off with the top block is the scenario. And then there, and it's a visual map. And I tell people, pretend it's a hologram that you're standing on. And so I'm in, everything is a scenario, right? Uh, uh, and I'll give you an example. Like the number one fear in the world is public speaking. I have been speaking now for decades and I've gone to some places where, um, I, uh, 
like they, they changed my time. Hey, you got a 30 minutes to talk. Now it's 10 minutes and now you're coming on next and you're like, fuck. Or I walk out and, and someone says, hey, can you come talk at this event? And I go out there, there's 500 people, there's live TV. And, and I'm like, holy shit. And I can remember a bunch of times calling my wife and going, okay, I'm freaking out. Like this is way bigger than I thought. It's live TV, Fox and CNN are here. There's 500 people. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I completely, I'm going blank. I'm like, my heart's pounding and she's like, calm down. You're like Mr. Fear Management. And and that's the thing is that people, and I tell this in a self-deprecating, honest way, that like I developed a lot of stuff. Like I've lectured at hospitals to psychology departments where they're taking notes on the research, right? And they're like, where did you come up with this? And I go, and I always make fun of them going, well, while you were studying, you know, Jung and Freud, I was actually talking to real people who were fucking managing fear while they were navigating life. Right, right. Right. And what I was looking for were those intersections going, oh, look what this, you know, this uh, special forces guy did. And look what this soccer mom did. And look what this this, you know, woman who was almost raped did. That was all the same mindset there. You know, right, that was right. all. And so, um, it, you know, it's an interesting thing. So the the uh, in the 80s, I was listening to an interview with this guy named Howard Gardner, who wrote this book. Uh, uh, called uh, Frames of Mind. He's a social scientist in this, and and he did this study, and he concluded, and the study was this: he said that eighty percent of our motivation is derived from our expectations. Eighty percent of our motivation was derived from expectations. So I got back to my office. It was nineteen eighty-five or six, and you know, there's no whiteboards back then. There's no smartphones, and I wrote down on the blotter on my on my desk on this blank piece of paper. I wrote down eighty twenty motivation expectation. And then I continue to to uh, to um, um, fill it out and going and say, I said, what happens after expectation? Like I was trying to create like a little flow chart. And so I wrote, uh, um, you know, OK, after expectations is what do we do? We got motivation, expectation. And, and then I was thinking of, uh, uh, you know, different words. And I'm pulling this up here just to show you. Uh, it, it was so cool. I created this flow chart called the cycle of behavior and the, um, the, uh, the visual of it is, is this concept of, of it's now it's morphed into this, like be a, um, think of it as like a hologram that you step on. Mm -hmm. So no matter where you are in life, if you get a fear spike, you look down, you go, okay, I'm in the scenario. So number one is scenario. Then it goes to motivation, to expectation, to visualization, to belief systems. Then I break down my belief systems there on what are my, my, uh, my neuro associations. In other words, how am I linking up the symbols or the, the evidence that I see? And then all of that coming together is creating this fear state. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and somewhere in there, you know, should be, uh, some, you, you, you had mentioned, uh, taking a step out or a step back and breathing. I mean, pro understanding box breathing, combat breathing, studying Brian McKenzie's art of breath research, Wim Hof, all this stuff to understand breathing. The problem with some of the stuff, well, it's not a problem. The problem with, with, uh, a breathing ritual is during a high stress moment, if the shit's happening, you got to figure out how to do it on the fly right? because it's right. all, it's all anaerobic. Sure. So, you know, but that's why, that's why I said earlier is that a lot of this homework ha should be done before. Right. So right? to, to piggyback on that, you know, a lot of this homework should be done prior to, do you kind of, do you uh, put this, this philosophy into practice uh, kind of, under the umbrella of if you want peace, prepare for war or, you know, practice should be harder than playing the game. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. So so, you know, it, and it depends on what level what level, uh, you know, you want to you want to do that uh, or what level you want to uh, take that at. And this is this is the visual here. And I'll I'll uh, I'll send you guys uh, uh, a link to that. OK. You can put it in your show notes. It's up online for people to look at. Sure. But. You know, so it depends like like this is used. I've had friends of this use this in business to prepare for big business deals. And I've had uh, uh, operators use this in their AAR after a training mission. Why would mm -hmm. you hesitate there? What happened here? Yeah, I was in the fear loop. I didn't know, you, you know, I didn't realize that corner was cleared. So I paused there and, you know, and, and people. So having a map, it's like the difference between lost and late. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like if you're lost, you're sitting there going, okay, man. So when you're, if you're really lost, you know, if, and depending on where you are, you might get really scared. I'm lost on the side of a mountain or lost in a jungle, you know, you know, if I'm, um, I'm lost in a mall, I'm probably not scared. I go, oh, there's a security guard, there's an exit sign, right? But what I mean by lost or late is I can be temporarily lost, but I kind of know how to navigate. So I realize my timeline's off because I, I, I took a wrong turn. Mm-hmm. Um, so having kind of a mental map as it relates to fear just means like, Okay, I'm going to be a little bit slower as I process this, but I've got to be able to self self uh, inspire and create a uh, a strategy to, ex- to extract myself from this situation. So the visual here is that I got to get out of the fear loop, and 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 I've got to understand. So inside the fear loop, or we use two acronyms: false evidence appearing real and false expectations appearing real. False evidence could be I bump into you at a bar. I turn around, I'm about to say, hey, watch it, asshole, because I think it was your fault. I look at you, you're wearing a tap-out shirt, and you got a cauliflower ear. <laughs> right? 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 So I turn around, and as soon as I saw your shirt and your cauliflower ears, I visualized, and what would happen right there? Why do you guys laugh? Because you you go, man, I could see that. Yeah. Right. right? And, and, you know, how many people, you know, uh, uh, I mean, you guys shoot, Right. Mm -hmm. So like how many people are really bad shots at the range? Almost all of them. All almost all of them. And (laughs) so if you're a bad shot at a range, a static target, how bad a shot are you in a gunfight? Right. Yeah. Horrible. And and statistically, people are bad shots in a gunfight, Mm -hmm. like even like trained law enforcement. Right. right? Because what happens in the gunfight and I'm not being cavalier about this to the listeners out there. I'm not judging anybody. It, what ha- like there's stories of like like good guy, bad guy getting a gunfight in an elevator and nobody gets shot. They run out of bullets. <laughs> <laughs> this, but this is true. Like how right. does that happen? That's because because the sudden impact of fear on your body creates a physiological response called the the startle uh, 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 startle uh, flinch response. And you know you can go stand three feet from a paper paper target point your gun at there and as you're shooting the trigger if i come around and bitch slap you your that bullet's probably not going to be on the paper and if it is you know it was fluke it wasn't because you came <laughs> and so what i'm trying to introduce to all communities is that if we don't understand the emotional impact and, and i wrote an article in 1993 called the theory of presumed compliance and it was i wrote a version for law enforcement i wrote a version for military and basically it says that how I feel affects how I think and how I think affects how I feel. Both of them influence how I move. Mm. Most of the time, most of the time we practice just the movement. So you practice the shooting and the clearing and the reloading. You practice, you know, uh, mount, dismount, side position. You practice kicks, punch, blocks. And so what we're practicing is the athleticism. I call it, I call it quickness. Like, or the neuromuscular relationship between moving my fist, my body, my knee, running, lifting, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But what we're not doing is we're not also educating the emotional psychological system. And so the emotional psychological system is what happens during sudden violence. That gets hit first. We know from neuroscience that your, uh, your, your reptilian brain can hijack your cognitive brain. So limbic system, amygdala, right? And you have trained people fucking hesitating, freezing, uh, uh, you know, screwing up shit. And and then everyone's confused. It's really simple. We're not stress, stress inoculating properly because we're not replicating violence in advance of violence. Sure. So all of my training, the most important training we do is where conventional training works on uh, finessing the complex motor skills. I work on, so that's where I talk about, a, like, like I call that the, the quickness development. Conventional training develops quickness. You know, coach is in front of you at focus pads. He puts his hand up, boom, you fire right. You've developed this Pavlovian relationship. But that's on balance, stimulus response training. I do our drills off balance, emotionally, psychologically, and physically. And we slow things down. We do things where we narrate. We do things in slow motion. We do them as fast as we can we do them as hard as we can and so you're developing relationships with your brain emotionally psychologically and physically and and what it's doing is it's changing it's it was called we call this brain-based learning but it's changing uh uh stimulus response uh 
neurons, myelin development, all this stuff. Because we can, we can, like I can tell people this guy trained with me for a week and, and look what he's doing. We did it. There was a, a police agency in, in uh, Pinellas County comes up to me after adopting our, our spear system training. And their lead trainer says, comes up to me at a, at a trade show. He goes, hey, Mr. Blauer. He goes, yeah. And he's standing with like six of his trainers are all wearing their, you know, their red polo shirts. He goes, uh, hey, on behalf of Pinellas County, we just wanted to say, fuck you. And I was like, I was like, whoa. And like, I'm indexing my knife, getting ready to get in a fight. Like, I'm thinking like, I'm like, whoa, what's going on? He goes, yeah, since adopting the spear system, all the uh, like recruits, once they learn fingers blade outside 90 and they understand the, the, the difference between a powerful effort and effortless power and using your body properly, right? He says, like, they're fucking us up. They're, <laughs> like, they're, they're like, right? And, like, it was the biggest compliment, but, like, they played it well, man. I was, like, I was at this booth at the SWAT, SWAT roundup standing behind my table and these guys like walk up they've done this on purpose like you know walk up with like these you know spartan looking faces like or, but they just said man like you know as because they were all the role players who are now attacking them during during their their sure. academy but just changing the relationship between understanding fear physiology and startle flinch and how to convert that changed what they could do to these and there was a study an independent study done in the uk uh now by two police departments, Dorset PD and Manchester PD, that showed a 50% reduction in head trauma just from integration of the system, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when you flinch is your hands come up to protect your head and then they push away danger. So I reversed engineered a, a whole close quarter combative system around weaponizing the start of flinch. You know, um, it's, it's, I don't know how we got onto that shit, but, <laughs> but, but it's, it's kind of a, I, I think it just relates to it, re, it relates to like just the whole fear thing and yeah you know, but uh yeah so you know it's my my big brother is an infantry marine and he's getting ready to uh be an instructor at the um uh infantry officers course out in quantico uh have you presented presented there yet I've been. I have not. I've. I've. I've been over here at at Pendleton. I'm okay. on the West Coast. But I. I mean, I've been down uh, to Quantico. I've done some stuff with the mm. FBI there. Okay. And any. And any time I go there, uh, I visit. I mean, that old village and the history there. Yeah. Uh, man, I just. I just love going there. I've been there many times just to. Awesome. You well, know. now now that uh, we have an in there, I'd love to see if we could set something up so you go present at the the infantry I've, officers course. That'd be so awesome. Um, I'd be honored. I'd be honored, man. Um, but uh, a, a segue there is, you know, one of the the things that we pride ourselves on as Marines, and I don't know if this is fact or fiction, but we we spend a lot of time doing live fire scenarios. And uh, as I understand it, we're you know one of the if the if not the only service that still participates in live fire exercises, um, obvious for obvious reasons, uh, um, and uh, I think it goes back to uh, you need to know what an actual round sounds like downrange so that you can act accordingly. Um, and I think that goes back to the, the, the stimulus and the, the fear inoculation, as you call it, um, you know, when you get over there, quote unquote, and shit hits the fan, it's, it's not new or it's, right. it's less new, I guess yeah. is the, the more accurate way to put it. Um, it, is that doctrine for you? Yeah, I mean, you want to like I, I make a distinction in our courses between uh, a simulation and replication that that, you know, if I show you a simulation, maybe there's some improv there, but a replication sounds a little bit more, you know, accurate. Like if I say, hey, this is a replica of a gun, you expect it to be the exact weight and have the, you know, but if I, you know, so you go buy a gun for your kid at Toys R Us and it's a simulated weapon. But you can buy replicas. It's just that distinction. Like when mm -hmm. when when we do our scenario training, we're actually looking at body cam, helmet cam, CCTV, uh, you know, smartphone coverage. So because I don't want to, if I do a scenario with you guys, I'm not interested in in sparring with you. I'm trying to cultivate uh, a a so between stimulus and response is this 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 uh, space called refractory uh, uh, time. And your your job there is to de decrease that gap. In training and the only way to do that is is to educate your brain 
Mm-hmm. to develop better pre-contact cue awareness and self-awareness and then make sure that your training is 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 uh not just the activity but you're you're actually training your brain like how to threat discriminate and make and make you know decisions quickly and we're using like big technical tactical terms here but this is the same thing if you're a crossfit athlete it's the same thing if you're a businessman you know when 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 somebody hesitates in business and loses his company or 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 sells at the right time and and makes a shitload of money or you go oh, oh wow she just looked at me and, and and i picked up this vibe of her but i'm gonna go ask her to dance now like it's all everything is timing right right mm-hmm. um and people ask me how important is speed in a confrontation? And what they're what I know they're talking about is like fast twitch muscle fibers and like that type of speed. And I go, speed is everything. Speed in recognizing the opportunity or the danger. Speed in managing your your fear, that fear spike that you get. You know, do you use it as a fuel or do you use it or does it stymie and redirect you? Mm-hmm. And now you grab doubt and hesitation, right? So speed is everything. I haven't even talked about moving yet. All in the, nobody <laughs> does right. You don't do shit. You don't do shit, guys. If your brain doesn't tell you to, the mind navigates the body. Mm-hmm. You know. And so, going back to your question about gunfire and all of that, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the name Chesty Puller. Oh right? yeah. Okay. So, I mean, he he was the first guy who like freaked out the Marine Corps like 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 back in the day where he said, "Hey, I want these guys downrange. We're going to fire rounds over their head," and everyone was like, "Whoa." don't do that that's dangerous he goes you know i don't want the first time they hear around whipping by them to be in a real fight right. and he so he was intuitively way ahead of the game so mm-hmm. our job you know like with with you know our job as a as a scenario based training company and regardless of what we do and it, it it could be and i've worked with mma guys i've worked with crossfitters i work with and but my main thing is law enforcement military and then we've got we train the general public in our be your own bodyguard program and so we're teaching people uh how to think about violence understanding if you understand the architecture and you have a mental blueprint for it what you've done is you've changed your perception speed if you change your perception speed you decrease your reaction time so that's what our objective is there is like pick up danger early and fucking move <laughs> and, stuff, right? and, 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 and the direction you move is going to be based on the proximity to the threat, right? It's not always towards the danger. And sometimes, sure. sometimes it's, it's, it's a way. So, yeah. Yeah. So how do you, I want to, let's, I want to talk about how you put this philosophy to work in your own life. And I'm going to ask you two questions and you can answer them on, uh, any, any fashion, whether it's mental, physical, or spiritual, or, or all three for that matter. Um, what do you do each and every day to feed yourself and put everything that you preach into practice? And then the follow on to that is what do you do each and every day to fuel yourself so that it becomes, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, reflexive. Instinctive. Re- yeah. Re- instinctive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Those are cool questions. So, uh, feed and fuel. Um, I'm a, a voracious reader. I've now switched over to audiobooks because I don't have time to, to like, I'll, I'll go on walks. I'm working this morning. I was working out uh, reviewing uh, uh, Daniel Coyle's book on uh, um, the talent code, mm. uh, listening to it on audiobook. Uh, you know, the other day I was, uh, you know, listening to uh, Viktor Frankl's uh, um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And I've got all these different, like, and, and, and I've always been able to, you know, back in the day before, uh, we had shit on iPads and shit like that. I used to travel and I would have three or four books in my, in my, uh, I'm traveling a lot in my briefcase. And, uh, um, I don't know where or why, but I, I could like read a book like for like 45 minutes or an hour and then go, like go from like a, a fiction to a nonfiction to a, and I would just do that. So I was always like, you know, I mean, that was my feeding. Uh, and, and I would hear stuff and, uh, it would just give me ideas for things. And, and I would just start. So I'm always, you know, I write every day, uh, and, and, uh, that feeds and fuels. I, I post stuff like, you know, I wrote, I posted something the other day. It was interesting. Uh, my, my right hand guy, Adrian here, he, he said, Hey boss, check this out. We should do this here. Like, uh, where you, you know, look at these, uh, old videos that you did in the 80s and 90s 
and comment on them and we just share that so he pops something up on the tv in in the office and there's these clips of me from 30 fucking years ago like a generation ago throwing kicks and punches and doing these drills and and i like i got nauseous like i got i was like almost didn't recognize myself i didn't recognize the movement i don't remember my body being that lean, <laughs> like you know, my my metabolism has changed a little bit, you know. And it was really, it was it was for 24 hours. I was wrestling this, like, 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 not depression, but I was like, oh my god, I'm fucking old, uh-huh. you know. People go, no, you're not. You know, you're only 57. But I was like, no, that's like, look at this. And 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 I ended up writing a big article about that about the aging athlete, mm-hmm. and and. Um, so I write something every day that feeds and fuels me, mm. but it also feeds and fuels anybody who's paying attention. I put it out on on social media for people, uh, and and it uh, it's a singular focus and it's a passion, and and there's there's no agenda. Almost like we said, and like when when we you know before we started recording, is. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't care if you come to my course or not. We're fucking busy, you know, and and we're doing some stuff. It's on you. And if you don't come to the course, it's because you don't understand fear, mm-hmm. right? Because what will happen is fear will go, oh, I don't need that, right? You know, uh, I live in a bubble. I'm safe. Or, or you know, your unconscious bias says, I don't need that. Like, I'm already getting that here. Uh, the more you can understand about this. And so that's really how I feed and fuel myself is I continue to educate. I continue to uh, uh, nourish and nurture uh, by exposing and and I'm not afraid to like I was in a meeting the other day where somebody who's like a subject matter expert was telling me how they were implying very gently how I was getting this wrong da 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 and they were very compelling and very convincing and I just said you know I'm gonna weigh in and and consider that and digest that that doesn't resonate with me right now I'm not afraid to just disagree I'm not gonna just adopt something and and so. Uh, um, you know, I th- probably about 20 years ago, I read, uh, something about this, this notion of, of being able to reinvent yourself every day. And somehow that, that really resonated with me. So that's what I do. Uh, you know, I've got, uh, so much scar tissue and injuries, neck, shoulder, elbows, uh, you know, from all the training and fighting and stuff like that. And there's days when I'm in like insane pain and it's, so it's, a it's a, it's a, it's a battle sometimes just going, I'm going to go work out today. And then, mm-hmm. and then it's like, no, I'm not going to work out today. Right. Okay. And so, um, that is navigating the fear loop. I use my system to live, right. Sure. I've used, you know, uh, uh, and that's the cool thing is like, you know, we'll, you know, we'll have with my company and I've got affiliates around the world and stuff like that. And, you know, we'll have this meeting where everyone's like freaking out about something. I go, Hey guys, Everyone's in the fucking fear loop. Maybe you've heard of this guy, Tony Blauer. He developed yeah. this thing called the cycle of behavior. Maybe we should like fucking not going, like, you're all fired, right? Like, <laughs> I'm joking. Like, um, and, but what I'm reminding people, what I'm reminding people in a, in a tongue in cheek, uh, uh, you know, fashion here is that you don't, you don't just stop learning. You don't just stop growing. You don't go, oh, okay, I'm a black belt in life and I don't, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, and anybody who really understands martial arts will tell you that when you get your black belt, that's when you really start to learn. Like that's the metaphor, mm-hmm. right? So, um, so yeah, the, the, uh, the feed and fuel thing is voracious reading. Uh, the, the, you know, new rituals as I started a couple of podcasts, uh, and, and, uh, I realized doing them that I'm a fucking horrible listener. Right. Uh, uh, why is because like I've been the guy like with the mic in my hand for 30 years. Like I just one year I did one year I was on the road 262 days. That's more than your deployments. Right. Yeah. You know, like like dude, when I was cutting my teeth back in in the 80s and 90s and then in the 90s when I started doing seminars and I closed my school, it was just me. And I was like. You know, I once like was like seven weeks, seven cities, like, and these are all five day, 40 hour courses. Yeah. People go, man, I want to do what you do. And I go, 
you have no idea what I do, mm-hmm. right? You know, right. I can tell you the inside of hotel rooms. I'm not visiting cities and, you know, and, and, you know, now we've grown a bit. I've got like an amazing MTT, our mobile training team. So I've got guys helping me and, 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 uh, uh, you know, we've grown over the last three decades, but, uh, it's, it's been a journey. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but so, so the, the feed and fuel, it, 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 it's, uh, like I want to tell people, like the most important thing that that if if you if there's one thing that you take away from this talk, guys, it's understanding. Uh, and we didn't talk about it a lot, but self awareness. Everyone mm-hmm. needs to cultivate so because it's only through self awareness that you understand fear. Sure. Mm-hmm. And so so you know if you can meditate on that, uh, everyone should cultivate male, female, whatever age you can, self awareness, and it changes. You know, my son, he's 26. He's been crossfitting for 10 years, teaching for seven years, just moved back to California. And I'm telling him things that I've learned, you know, in the last couple of years about life, about business, about people. And I'm going, you know, like my dad never had these talks with me. And I'm telling him right up front, nobody ever mentored me like this. I didn't know this. I had to figure this shit out. You know, you're 26 now and I'm giving you all this stuff. And he's like looking at me and I smiled and I went, you know, if somebody tried to tell me this when I was 26, I'd be probably thinking, what's this old fucker talking about? But, <laughs> you know, I like, like, so, but, but this, understand this guys, this is my kid and I love him. Right. Mm-hmm. And I want to be successful. But the conversation I had in my head is I can't expect or demand or legislate that he applies what I'm teaching him. He may still need to, like I did wait 30 years to get it. I'm hoping it'll accelerate cause I'm planting good seeds. Right. right. But that's that whole thing is I need to have the self-awareness to understand that he may not have the self-awareness. Sure. Ah, Mm. That's awesome. That's fantastic. And before we let you go, where can everybody follow and support you either personally, your company, everything that you have going, your classes and seminars as well? Yeah, cool. Um, So our website, blowerspear.com, we are launching. uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to reach people in a more profound way because a lot of the stuff a lot of the stuff can really be just uh, um, uh, uh, kind of self-actualized through listening like our most important lecture is our no fear lecture right and when you when you come to that and you do no fear you're just sitting in a chair listening to me talk so we just actually recorded the no fear presentation and put it up online for people and so we're, we're developing what we call Spear, Spear University, you know, and so there'll be a place where, uh, you know, your law enforcement military, here's, here's some content for you in, in advance of your course. You're just a, a good Samaritan, a citizen who wants to understand shit. So, uh, we're going to be launching, uh, this month Spear University and, and all of those resources. If people go to Blauer, my last name, B-L-A-U-E-R, Spear, uh, if you want to, see me rant about uh uh snowflakes and and liberals uh go to my instagram tony blower if you want more about just our self-defense and our training uh just go to the spear dot system but we're on instagram we're on facebook we're all over use google (laughs) (laughs) oh hey thank you so much for uh imparting that your your knowledge uh with us today um i think that our our listeners our community our family will get a ton out of it and you know if nothing else they'll take a look deep inside and start analyzing their fear and their interpretation of it and uh hopefully in the aftermath of this conversation they start to use fear as fuel rather rather than hesitation yeah, just remember, guys, listening to this, that that you know, it's it's either cathartic. It ultimately it's cathartic if you, if you just go towards it. Just don't be cavalier about it, right? You know, a lot of people confuse. Oh, I like 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 the expression, "Do one thing that scares you every day." Mm-hmm. No, no, think about <laughs> like like be intelligent about about that stuff. It should be <clears throat> stuff that resonates with your personal growth, right. where you're at, and 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 the caveat to that is don't do things that are dangerous and reckless. Sure. Right. You can't recover from negligence. So don't be an idiot. Right. So just, uh, you know, so, uh, but yeah, this was fun guys. You guys are great. I did not tell you how I started and, and I did not tell you the background and we'll, you know, we can talk offline about that one day, but, uh, uh, this was a lot of fun. You guys are great. You got a good vibe and a good energy. So I'm excited to, to have connected. 
Hey, absolutely. Hey, we'll, we'll we'll do this again down the road. Yeah. We'll 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 get to the bottom of those other those other questions. Yeah, hit me up whenever. <laughs> man. If your audience has some specific questions or scenarios, I'd love to jump back on and 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 dig into those. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, reach out to Tony uh, on all of his social media platforms, and you know he can answer any of those individual questions as well. Uh, we really appreciate you being open to our community for that. And uh, we'll definitely do this again down the road, man. And yeah. when as you get your, your podcast launched, you know, we, we'd love to jump on there and collaborate with you on, on your side, too. Oh, yeah, let's do that. So, yeah, we, we started actually the No Fear podcast. There you go. So uh, um, let's let's get you guys on there and, uh, and talk about some stuff. No doubt. That'd no doubt. Sweet. Thanks a lot, brother. Thanks so much. Okay, Tony. be safe. Bye, guys. You Later. Know, take care. And that'll do it for this episode with our special guest, Tony Blower. If you want to check out everything that Tony has going, please go to the full show notes on feedmefuelme.com. Also, be sure to connect with us on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at FeedMeFuelMe. We would love to hear from each and every one of you. If you found this episode inspiring in any way, please leave a rating and a comment in iTunes so we can continue on this journey together. Also, be sure to share it with your friends and family on social media, including Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, or any other social platforms that you use. We really appreciate you spending your time with us today and allowing us to join you on your journey. We would love to hear your feedback on this episode, as well as guests and topics for future episodes. To end this episode, we would love to leave you with a quote by Bear Grylls. Being brave isn't the absence of fear. Being brave is having that fear, but finding a way through it. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Way to make it to the end of the show. As always, go to Shrug Collect over at iTunes. Give us a five-star review, positive comment, and hit thrivemarket.com slash feedme to get that great deal on awesome groceries. See you next time.